it is from us, gentlemen, on this final segment before lunch, what we hope is going to be a really important discussion, an issue that needs to touch every single person in, their, in the room in terms of their thinking about their role in business and the role of business in society. Asia 2030 is our vision for this uh, summit. 2030 is very apposite because 2030 was the goal set for the Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations signed up to countries all around the world saying that we need to find a new trajectory uh, towards uh, being in harmony with the planet and in harmony with people by 2030 and the 17 Sustainable Goals Development goals stand there uh, as uh, an action plan uh, to get us towards there. 2030 also significantly because the IPCC, uh, looking at climate change, has said by 2030, in the next decade, we've got to radically alter the trajectory um, in terms of decarbonisation if we're to stay under the 1.5 degree uh, temperature increase. You only had to turn your televisions on last night or this morning to see around the world uh, the emotion from a new generation saying, hang on a minute, something is going wrong and our leaders, our businesses are not listening to that wake-up call around climate change. Add into that issues of deforestation, um, loss of biodiversity, plastics in the ocean. There's a whole raft of things that seem to be going wrong. And yet there is an opportunity and a call now to say, well, maybe the way we do business, our business purpose, is part of the problem. And looking positively, the positive side of crisis, saying we can actually transform. We can be part very much of the solution. It's not just about making profit, providing goods and services people want, but it's actually being part of a regenerative economy a transformational change. We don't just look as businesses at shareholder value, uh, return on investment. We actually become part of creating a better world, a noble enterprise, both uh, comfortable in terms of regeneration around our environment, but also in terms of ensuring that no one is left behind. That's a big opportunity. And our discussion this afternoon is really going to open up some thoughts uh, around that. I'm delighted that I'm joined by two people to stimulate us in that, in that journey. First of all, uh, Philippe Joubert, former CEO of Alstom, and now founder and CEO of Earth on Board, a kind of ecosystem organisation trying to have conversations within the boardroom about uh, challenge and moving towards uh, sustainable development at the very heart of organisations. Also joined by Jim uh, Schnaber, who's chairman of the supervisory board of Siemens. So, I think I'd like to come first of all to you, Philippe. I'm very interested. Uh, this conversation about business and uh, doing more than just providing return on investment, profit, etc. This is not a new new thinking, but there seems to be a new um, conversation happening now. Uh, I know that the Business Roundtable, big association of CEOs in America, um, and their largest company, has now declared that community and environmental um, objectives uh, are as equal or greater importance than uh, shareholder value. So just interested in your take on what's going on in terms of this new debate about regenerative businesses and economy and some of the roots uh, from that. Thank you. Uh, just the subject is quite interesting. And by the way, you just to notice that this subject is capable to put Siemens and Alstom on the same table <laughs> and agrees about something which is already an achievement. So, but you hide, this is not new, because when you look back a few years, like for example, 1800s in Europe, 
You know that to, to go and to have a license for business, the state, at the time the emperor or the king, were delivering you a limited liability license. But the counterpart was what you are going to do is useful for the society and the community. So this as the business has started. With this grant, and this is why we had the li limited liability at the beginning, against a kind of, you could call that, modern uh, social license work rate. And then we can develop like this. He went to Europe, UK, United States, and then came the economist. And the financial markets became sophisticated. And the money started flowing. And then we start to measure performance differently. And we forgot these limited liability things and the, the interest for the society. And we transformed that in limited liability, limited risk, but unlimited profit. And this is uh, what we put the business in at the time. So you may, you may say, but what happened? Why are we now? It was perfect. Limited liability, unlimited profit. Why do we change? We change for a very simple reason. We reach the planet boundaries. Now, we are stuck with something that we are starting to measure. We are starting to see that the risks are increasing and are unmanageable. Plenty of examples of not very clever behavior that we have had and that are now starting to hit the PNL. And the profit are starting to, to get more difficult to generate, and costs are starting to increase. And why do we want to change this? Why the, the chairman and CEO of uh, Morgan, uh, uh, the, uh, the business roundtable in the United States, said we have to come back to the purpose. Not because he suddenly became altruistic. Perhaps he is personal. But his business is still geared to make profit, and that's very good. But he understood that his business is at risk because our, our condition, our operating conditions are no longer viable for the long term. So that's why we are changing uh, the way we are doing. And we are going back to very naturally the purpose. So also a very simple reason. You are all business leaders. We are, you are all business men and women in the room. Who is working for a business that have been created one morning with the founder waking up and saying, today I want to create a business. I say, which business? I don't know yet, but why do you create it? Ah, I just want to make money. This is not true. All the business in this room have been created for a purpose. And then we generate profit, obviously, to maintain it. But this is where, this is the tipping point. And that's why 2015, to my own analysis, will be seen as the year where we are changing. This is the year where we have the SDGs that for the first time is decoupling business and growth from abusing planet and social capital and the negotiation in Paris with the zero net emission world which is absolutely necessary if you want to have a world with me. I'm just interested, I mean you, you uh, go into boardrooms across the world is there something really significant happening in terms of recognizing just the scale of the risk and the challenge? Because business is very good about it, kind of its risk registers, registers and absorbing new issues, all the rest of it. You know, the voices I hear from science and all the rest of it are that we that actually we have got bigger challenges than we thought, and they're coming down the track much, much faster. Are you sensing that within the boardrooms we're waking up to the fact that we've, we've actually got a bigger challenge than we thought and less time to do something about it than we thought? I, I would say yes, uh, for very simple reason, because we are seeing now risk that we cannot manage. Uh, I was taking example, uh, Sonny Berger that everybody knows here, the, the, the CEO and founder of Ola, I wrote an article one year ago saying we have to stop, we have to change because this year I will have to buy 3 billion bees. If not, my business goes away, no pollination. We have now, I was 
the CEO of Alstom Power, and we are building coal plants, uh, being coal plants, and these coal plants are being shut down now, in India, for example. Why are they being shut down? Not because of lack of coal, because of lack of water to cool them down. So we are reaching, and then the, obviously the, the board are starting to get aware of this, and what gives me a lot of hope that we're going to change and, and win this battle is financial market is also moving in. You have in the room banks and institutions that are moving in that direction. Again, not only because they are either visionary or altruistic, but because their business must be must change or they are in trouble. Mm -hmm. Jim, Jim Schnarr, I'd like to bring you in as um, uh, chair of the uh, oversight board of Siemens, a long uh, history uh, very much uh, within this realm. Um, we often look and see that, ah, we've got a problem. Technology is one of the great uh, areas of innovation and change that will allow us to re-engineer and move in a positive direction. Um, and when we're looking at uh, the new uh, economy, if we're looking about moving towards a circular economy, a resource efficient economy, a decarbonized economy, um, would be interested to have one or two of your reflections, partly maybe uh, with a glint of hope in your eye that actually there are some extraordinary changes taking place within the technology world that offers us solutions. But maybe observations also from you in terms of, of, of the governance of the boards as to whether they are really getting this and buying into uh, a, a new way forward. Well, thank you very much. Um, I actually believe that we are at a very significant inflection point. You mentioned that as well. Uh, I recently wrote an article on LinkedIn, um, which I titled It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, inspired by Charles Davis, the tale of two cities. And I think this morning illustrated very well that it's the worst of times. We had the geopolitical turmoil, uh, we had trade wars, we had Brexit, we had uh, multi-dimensional um, um, discussions. Uh, Disappearing, we have climate change, we have growing, you know, reduction of growth rates. There's like plenty of reasons, and we have social unrest in, in a number of countries. And so, so my hope was that this session would be illustrating that it might be the best of times. Um, and you mentioned 2015 as a very important point. It's the first time in history that world leaders came together and argued uh, a common language. Um, we find 17 uh, goals uh, that are critical to solve, to be solved by 2030. And technology, being a technologist, I work with technology my entire life. I'm convinced that we are at a tipping point from a technological point of view where we are challenging some of our assumptions. So if you take energy, I mean, earlier this morning we talked about, uh, and someone said, you know, coal is still the cheapest uh, source of uh, energy. That's just not true anymore. Actually, if you have a raw material for production of energy that's free, like the sun or the wind, it's hard to compete with it. If technology to extract that raw material improves, and the price on wind has gone down dramatically, the industry is consolidating, we've been uh, adding to that consolidation with Siemens Camisa. The, the, the price of solar on good locations is half the price of the cheapest fossil. So this is no longer a philanthropic project to do some sustainable energy. It's becoming almost more free. And that is a tipping point to create sustainable energy and challenge the old way of living. We have the same in transportation. We'll have electric vehicles, there will be autonomous vehicles, will take away the pollution of transportation, will take the inconvenience of, of traffic jams away. We have uh, education, where you can have access to the best minds on this planet. I take a course every Friday on power on my PC at home in Copenhagen. It's for free. And of course, we'll have a chance to reinvent us in it. And so all the technologies are kind of there to solve, in my opinion, most of the 17 SDGs. 
So what's the challenge? Well, first of all, we're way too slow. If we media project our current progress since 2015, we'll reach the sustainable development goals around 2090, which probably means we'll never get a chance to reach them at all. Secondly, I think we have the wrong assumptions. We continuously debate in forms like this, is I going to give our profit to be more sustainable? And I'm arguing a case where if you use technology in the right way, you can make money by making sustainable solutions. And you will win the next battle and leave competition behind and still believe that it's being uh, not taking care of this uh, bottom line, the planet's bottom line it is a better business. And, and, and then I think also we are probably talking too much and acting too little. Uh, and, and, and I look at the business leaders in this room. I do not believe that the political environment right now will solve these problems. But if you take the power of global businesses, the innovation capabilities that we have, and apply the technologies we have today, we can actually show a path forward that's dramatically better than what we have. Forty-seven percent of Siemens' total revenue today, let's say 80 plus billion euro companies, is associated with solving sustainable problems for our customers. It's a good business to do. Thank you for that. Uh, just a question uh, coming in, or a, a comment to you to uh, offer a comment on, uh, from Sir Martin Sorrell. Uh, don't we overcomplicate the purpose or sustainable, uh, sustainability objective? Isn't it simply a focus on the long term that is necessary? There's no conflict between the long term profitability and taking into account the interests, uh, interests of all the stakeholders? Can we just comment? That, yeah, sure, the, the, absolutely right. Uh, the purpose is because I strongly believe that uh, only business can really put us in the right direction. Uh, only business has the strength, the speed, the technology, the, the, the organization to react to this magnitude of, of, of challenge. So that's why coming back to the purpose is important. Uh, but obviously, to consider to go out of shareholder primacy and uh, sometimes I say shareholders own shares. They don't own the company. Company is much more complicated than just a bunch of shares. By the way, unfortunately now we have more short, uh, uh, share traders than shareholders. And so to think that you should put the destiny of your company in the end of a short term, I uh, come back to the question. Uh, vision is extremely dangerous, and you really need uh, to consider the stakeholders. That's why boards are so important, because this is the only place in a company where clever people, informed people, uh, John and several, should make decisions that consider the whole stakeholder interest and arbitrate the natural conflict that you have in the direction of the purpose of the company. Right. I just want to have another question uh, coming in, which is, despite calls to change how companies profits um, at, the expense, at the expense of the environment community, it's still business as usual for many. So the best in class are doing extraordinary stuff, real transformation. Um, but um, there are too many companies who are either choosing to ignore this um, or are too slow in uh, uh, making changes. What can we do about that? How do we increase the pace of change and thinking right across the board and not just uh, in those leading companies? Well, if we do believe that we're at a tipping point, it's not unusual that you have some let's say, trying to add the new dimensions to their business models and taking a lead on others who are missing the opportunity. I mean, I'm often reminding my teams that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stone. Uh, we simply had better technologies that made you know, a, a more sense, and, and those who stayed with the stone probably disappeared. Um, so I think that's normal. I think it's right that the conversation of strategy is moving into the and it really starts with what problems are we trying to solve? Maybe that's purpose, I don't know, I actually agree with Martin's comment that 
There is not a conflict between long term and short term if you know why you invest. And so far, we've used technology, this incredible technology that we have. We've never had an arsenal technology like we have now to solve irrelevant, stupid problems. Like, how can I share a picture of my cappuccino cup with my digital friends and get some likes? And then allow these companies to create monopolies around the data that they steal from the consumers uh, and pay no taxes. I mean, that's not a very smart way of using smart technology. So, so what problems do we need to solve is the conversation is important. And there you can start with the SDGs, most companies do today. Um, and then you figure out how can I apply technology and my core competence to solve these problems in a way that give me a profitable business because otherwise it's not sustainable. And how can I do that better than my competition, which means you're actually managing the short and the long term. This is possible today and I believe that is uh, that will happen and those who do that will create a we come out of a world where being, let's say, sustainable-oriented um, was a philanthropic question after you made your profit. So you make revenue, you pollute the world and you make a profit because you don't pay for the externalities. And then you have a conversation about how much of my profit should I do good with. And I think we're at a stage where it's about how do I make my money in a way that's sustainable. And that's a shift. So what can be done to accelerate this? Well, obviously it has to be good business to do good. And therefore, the policy framework. For instance, a Gobian tax system where we start taxing labor, which is not a, a resource that is constrained in any way, and start taxing externalities um, or use of resource, would dramatically uh, increase the amount of companies realize that it's a good business to use Right. Okay. I've got a polling question, our last uh, polling question of the morning that I'd like everyone to engage in. And this is thinking about if we want to increase the pace uh, and the scale of transformation towards uh, business being at the heart of regenerative economies, um, which factor do you think would be most significant uh, in compelling uh, businesses to act in favour of a regenerative uh, economy. So, uh, we've got that polling question up there. So, uh, which factor do you think would be most significantly compel businesses to act in favour of a regenerative uh, economy? Um, is it the physical risks to assets, supply chains due to worsening climate change uh, related disasters and other factors? Um, so that's a kind of uh, the threat? Is it growing consumer pressure? Uh, would it be more government regulation that incentivizes the good stuff and penalizes the bad stuff? Or would it be uh, opportunities, business opportunities for regenerative uh, capitalism? So there you go. Have a quick think about that and we will see what has emerged. I think there's going to be about another 15 seconds for you to find the app, push the button, and influence the outcome. Okay, there we go. Uh, maybe just take a brief uh, comment on that. Uh, it may be that we have 500 responses or five, but that's what we've got there. Philip, do you want to just offer a comment on that and a response to that question? Yeah, this is great. This is, uh, I'll just give you a, a small story. I am French, as perhaps you can hear, but uh, I am also Brazilian. And you know that uh, we had some problem recently uh, with fires in Brazil. Uh, interestingly enough, this is now being thought of not because of government reaction or because of the 10 million that we want to send to Brazil, but because last week the leather buyers of Europe send a letter to the leather manufacturer in Brazil saying they're going to stop to buy leather from Brazil because they understood leather from cow, cow from land, land from deforestation, deforestation from fires. Soya are doing the same thing. And recently, big banks are starting to sell it on finance. So the, the combination of consumer and, and, and financial actors are much more powerful and much more fast, by the way, than any other reaction.
interesting. And maybe Jim, just as we're right out of time, a final comment, maybe in response to that, but also a message to all of us in this room about that journey towards a regenerative economy. Well, I, I think that the answer is a correct sentiment of what's going on. Uh, unfortunately, it's a defensive story. And I think we need the offensive story, which is actually the blue and the, and the dark one, and the, the black one. Uh, so so uh, uh, 10 years ago, I went on a journey to understand some of the issues of this world, and I came back to the conclusion that policy makers will probably not solve the problems, but leadership will. And uh, we had uh, actually a conclusion from that trip, which was good for business. And basically said, doing better is good, but doing good is better, and doing both is best. I think that's our obligation as business leaders to show that there is an opportunity right now because of technology to do both. Thank you very much. And maybe in this summit uh, in Asia, uh, in Singapore, is the opportunity to show that extraordinary leadership of how Singapore could be uh, building on its uh, innovation potential in this area. So a great opportunity for us to be very much part of the future uh, rather than a footnote in history. So thank you very much, Philippe and Jim, uh, for your contribution. We hope it stimulated your conversation, uh, and I'm sure the conversation will continue over lunch and long into the future, uh, though we don't have long to be making some of the profound, significant shifts uh, that are needed. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.